Well, welcome to the Beyond Cinema Studio up here at TIFF, uh, Mr. Tim Jennison. Um, talk to me about how you got involved with Tim's Vermeer. Did you know Teller? Obviously, Teller is the credited director on this film of Penn and Teller fame. Um, did you get onto this project as kind of a Mythbusters exercise that's kind of gone wild and kind of morphed into this feature film, or how did it first uh, how did it first ruminate? I've known Penn and Teller for a long time. Uh, and I got a strange email from Penn one day. It sounded desperate. He said, I need an adult conversation. I'm only talking to toddlers and people I work with. And he's got a young family, and he, you know, he missed hanging out with his friends. And, and so I said, sure, I'll come, uh, I'll come over. So I, had to, I flew from San Antonio to uh, Las Vegas. We sat down at a restaurant, and he said, oh... Um, it, please talk to me about something that's not politics and not show business and nothing involving work. Uh, what do you got for me? And I said, uh, I think I figured out how Vermeer painted those pictures. And he said, what? I said, well, you know who Vermeer is? And he says, yeah, I went, I went to a show in, in New York with all these Vermeers, the guy that paints like photographs. And I said, yeah, I think I, I think I figured out how he did it. He said, well, how do you do it? And I said, well, I've got my camcorder here, and I showed him uh, this crude experiment that I did where I'm looking down through this mirror, and I can match the colors exactly, as well as the shapes, and you get this handmade photograph, and it just works way too well. And he said, I totally get how this works. Um, what are you going to do with this? And I said, uh, you know, maybe write a paper or... Uh, make a YouTube video or something. He said, that is a really stupid idea because this could be a real film. Um, let's go talk to some people about you know getting this going. He said, stop everything. Don't do anything else until we can get some cameras rolling. And so from the very inception, um, I had cameras pointed at me. It was just like um, usually four motion picture cameras a lot of uh, still cameras set on uh, time lapse and uh, webcams and you know I got this strange feeling I was being watched yeah. uh, and it, but it, it got everything from start to finish we didn't know if the experiment was going to work but my experiment was going to be I want to really paint a Vermeer I want to you know these, these are some of the most admired pictures in the art world They're, you know some people consider Vermeer to be uh, you know the uh, the ultimate painter because of his realism and the the tranquility and the beauty the composition of these paintings he only painted um, maybe thirty five pictures and um, my goal was to replicate one I've never painted in my life and I thought that would be the best proof that this machine would work if I as a non painter could do that. And, and, and uh, so after Penn got involved, I was kind of along for the ride. And, uh, I, you know, I have a lot of hobbies. I have too many hobbies. And many of them are sort of unfinished hobbies. And this probably would have been an unfinished hobby too, but there were all these cameras staring at me. And I didn't have a choice but to finish. It's and, a duty to perform. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, people were conference calling me, how's it going, is it going okay? And I hit some roadblocks, like um, I thought what Vermeer had done was to set up a camera obscura where he has his studio, he has his subjects out in broad daylight coming through the windows and then there's a dark booth and there's a lens installed in the wall that projects an image onto the back wall. It's a simple device that's been known since the ancient Egyptians. And most people think that you can probably paint right on top of that projection. Well, that doesn't work. It, uh, it, it, it gets in your way. It, if, you, if there's a shade of red there, you put some red paint on, it gets redder. You don't know how, well, is it too red? Is it not red enough? You have to turn the lights on and try to figure out what you just did. It does not help. It gets in the way. So I um, had to find a way to copy those colors and the way was an extra mirror that lets me see that image in the mirror but just off the edge of the mirror I can see my canvas 
the canvas has got some light coming down from the window too. And when, um, when the color is just right, you can't see the edge of the mirror. If the paint's too light, too dark, too red, too green, the mirror is visible. So you know it's a litmus test. It just says, yep, you've got the right color. Well, I had a lot of trouble getting that to work. The, the image was too dark, and I had to discover... I, I, at, at the same time, I went to see this painting at Buckingham Palace. It belongs to the Queen of England. It's not usually on show, right? It's not usually on show, and um, our producer, Farley Ziegler, used her wily ways to get us in to see it, and when I saw it, it was just... Uh, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was so different than the reproductions. Um, it, it was razor sharp and there was so much detail and it looked exactly like a photograph. So that part I, I was pleased about, but the, the amount of detail, I couldn't see that amount of detail in my, in my little box. So when I got back to San Antonio, I, uh, I, I, I was ready to give up, but I couldn't give up because all my friends were depending on me to finish this. And I'm already about oh, a year and a half into the project. I built this complete full-scale room, identical to Vermeer's studio with all the furniture, um, you know, and, but it just, I couldn't see it. And so uh, I just experimented. And I put a flat mirror up against the wall where that projection was. And I really didn't expect, I didn't know what to expect. I knew it wouldn't work. but. I saw a tiny little circle of the front of this harpsichord with this intricate design. And in that little circle, I could see everything razor sharp and about 300 times brighter than it was before. And I go, well, if only I could see the whole room that way, this would be fantastic. And then I realized that there, basically I could reposition that mirror and paint little parts of the room one at a time and I could throw away the dark room, I could work in full daylight. And that's, that's the breakthrough that it took. And so then it was a, just a process of coming in and painting every day. Is, is part of what made the masters great though, and Vermeer was interesting because he kind of fell off the map of history, and it was kind of, he was rediscovered by these textbooks that then kind of included him in this, and it was almost like a retro, retroactive acknowledgement that he was this great painter. So but is what part of, what made these guys great? Um, the mystery. I mean, between you know Mona Lisa's smile or Rembrandt's the eyes that follow you, or you know Vermeer's ability to capture you know the, uh, mm. probably most famously the mm. girl with the pearl earring. Mm. Um, but you know, is it is the pursuit of science for this purpose um, self defeating in a romantic sense? Or does it make you appreciate the romance more? Well, I'm not a typical art guy. I, I'm, a, I'm a geek. I'm a science guy. I, I'm a computer graphics guy. Uh, but the, the Vermeers do have this sense of mystery. I thought there was a true mystery here I, because these things are so true to life. And from what I know about the way human vision works, being a video guy, we, you know, we, we have to uh, create video compression formats, you know, so we know how the, what the eye can see, what the eye can't see. Vermeer was painting something the eye can't see. Those walls, those white walls in the back of the paintings, he painted them the way a video camera would record it, not the way our eye sees it. And it happens right in our retina, not in our brain. Our retina filters that out. And I could see, looking at these Vermeers, that he was painting something that was impossible. And I felt very strongly that, that there had to be a, a scientific explanation. Um, and you know, having found it and having, you know, replicated the Vermeer, I mean, I sat there and I painted, and when I was done, it looked exactly like Vermeer. So another trip back to Buckingham Palace to do the switcheroo? <laughs> that was plan A. Uh, you know, I hope they, you know, wait until they leave and then switch them. Um, no, they, they're quite security conscious there, as we found out. Um, but uh, I don't think it takes away the romance of Vermeer. To me, it makes him uh, understandable. It makes you know, before he was like a supernatural being, nobody could paint like Vermeer. Uh, in, in the modern age, when we have photographs now, 
we have the hyper-realist uh, painters, and, and generally they, they start with a photograph, they break it into a grid, and then they copy the colors very carefully to their canvas. And you can, pay, you can make photorealism that way. But, you know, to, how did Vermeer do that? Nobody knows. And, and, and now I think we do, and I think it makes Vermeer understandable. And um, he was probably just an extremely hard-working Renaissance man who knew some art and some science. Uh, and finally, if Vermeer seemed to be an impossible task and is now possible, what is the next impossible task for you to figure out? Well, pretty much the anti-gravity boots is what I'm working on now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I am interested in um, Caravaggio, who happened uh, you know, quite a while before Vermeer, after Leonardo, but before Vermeer. And I'm also looking at a lot of art and trying to read a lot of the uh, literature of the time, much of which has not been translated into English. So um, it, it, there's a lot in Latin and Dutch and Italian and mostly looking at pictures. And I'm seeing a kind of a pattern across Europe, across time, that I'm trying to construct. And the pattern appears to me right now, possibly it leads from Leonardo to Caravaggio, to the Caravaggisti in Holland, to a, a bunch of artists in Harlem, Netherlands, and, and, and then in, to Vermeer. Now, these guys were all members of the the Guild of St. Luke, which was their trade union, and they could not reveal their secrets to the lay public. And that could explain how a secret like this could be passed along and yet be totally forgotten and unknown today. Dead Poet Society. Exactly. Seize the day. Yes. Uh, very cool. Well, thanks for coming in and spending a few minutes with us. Pleasure chatting to you. Great to talk to you.